Well, her comments suggest that it certainly didn't help in her case. It is the traditional way that Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade operates, the logic being that uh, a big uh, public display or protest would force the other party, the other country, into some sort of negotiating corner and diminish your negotiating leverage. But what her account tells us and what the current situation unfolding in Myanmar with the detention of the Australian economic advisor to Aung San Suu Kyi, Sean Turnell, tells us uh, is that the quiet approach uh, does not yield uh, necessarily any returns at all. And after a full month with zero response to the Australian government's representations on Sean Turnell's case in Myanmar after the coup there, uh, absolutely zero and, in fact, insulting uh, uh, treatments and responses from Myanmar. Maurice Payne this week, after more than a month, finally got around to uh, announcing some very mild sanctions on the Myanmar military for the coup. Uh, actually applying pressure, uh, it seems, is more likely to produce results than the traditional silent approach. And, you know, a public, uh, a, a public pressure, a public concern, public noise may, in fact, be a more effective tool of leverage and negotiation. Mm. A, a not so subtle approach is granting uh, Ted Hoy refuge essentially in Australia. He, he, of course, was a Hong Kong legislator, and we're just learning about that now that he is, he is in fact, in Australia. Um, how is this going to escalate tensions between the two nations? How significant is this decision? Well, it's very significant in a couple of ways. One, it very firmly signals that Australia is not going to be intimidated by the coercive uh, program of economic pressure that Beijing and political pressure that Beijing is, is waging on Australia. Second, it's the first. Uh, I mean, Ted Hoy was uh, a, a very prominent and effective member of the Democratic Party in Hong Kong. Uh, he's the first prominent Hong Kong Democratic leader to take refuge in Australia. It's a precedent. It's not going to be the last one. And it shows that Australia is happy to be used now. What it's effectively going to be is a basis for Ted Hoy and other democratic uh, politicians from Hong Kong to operate from, to continue to mount their case, mount their cause, uh, and to oppose Beijing's extension of its iron grip over Hong Kong. So, of course, Beijing will not enjoy this. Beijing will complain about this. Uh, but it, it does represent affirming of Australian resolve and an important statement of support for the democratic principle and for democratic Chinese communities around the world. How effective can using Australia as a base for criticism for continuing their campaign against China be for, you know, re people fleeing Hong Kong? Um, well, when you consider that Ted Hoy is one of many of the Hong Kong Democrat politicians who say that they are now um, spreading uh, to divide the Labor across uh, all of the Five Eyes Alliance countries, Australia, US, Canada, Britain, New Zealand, so that they, they're hoping to create a chorus of democratic Chinese voices uh, opposed to Beijing around the world and using freedom of speech in, in all of our countries to mount their cause. And as first-hand victims of Chinese autocracy, uh, they're fairly credible and they're pretty outspoken. And to answer your question, how effective can they be? Well, probably the best measure will be the level of Beijing's irritation, which will be intense. Beijing, as you know, Bev, uh, claims extraterritorial extra uh, application of its national security law. So anybody in Australia or Canada or anywhere who dare uh, advocate, for example, for the independence of Hong Kong, according to Beijing, wherever you are in the world and whomever you are, you're going to go to jail. So this, this will test uh, Beijing's ability to enforce that. And it will test Australia's uh, uh, resolve in standing with this in the years to come. It is interesting too, uh, US President Joe Biden has moved very quickly to advance the Quad Alliance. That of course involves the US, India, Japan and Australia. Is it a signal as, as to how seriously this administration is taking China's influence in the region? Uh, it's an enormous signal, uh, Bev. This uh, is an escalation of the Quad to a level it's never been at. Uh, you know, initially 2007, it had, had a bit of a dry run, it faded and died. 2017, it was revived, uh, primarily in response to concern about China's uh, aggression in the South China Sea and East China Sea. 
It escalated from officials level, then went to uh, foreign ministers. And now what we're about to see, apparently, by the end of this week, is the first leaders meeting of the Quad. Now, this is giving real political weight uh, and real political resolve to a nascent new alliance, which just three years ago, Beijing, by the way, said was going to, quote, the foreign minister of China, uh, Wang Yi, said it was going to dissipate like foam on the ocean. Yeah. It was just a lot of nonsense. Well, uh, Beijing, uh, in response to Beijing's own uh, aggress aggression, pushiness, belligerence around the world, these four countries are now increasingly resolved to oppose. Uh, I mean, they say not. They say it's just about keeping the Indo-Pacific free and open. But we all know that it's clearly designed to try to check Chinese aggression. And Scott Morrison, in his comments, very interestingly, gave this a whole regional application by saying the Quad would help Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific maintain its stability and its sovereignty. It is interesting, Peter, because there's been this long-held argument, of course, that because of China's economic bulk alone, they cannot be resisted. And in fact, they, these alliances will not prove to be effective. Do, do you think that is going to be the case? Is there any precedent for us to look at to say, no, they can be resisted? Uh, yes, the argument you make um, is a common one. And to quote the Australian strategist Hugh White, Hugh has said that uh, when you look at the future projections of China's overwhelming economic power, quote, all else is detail uh, and it's pointless trying to stand opposed uh, to China's plans. Uh, but that's only if you look at Australia's bulk or the US bulk versus China alone. If you look at the quad countries, the four, and combine the four countries' GDP uh, against China's, you see that the combined uh, economic bulk of the quad countries is, is exactly double that of China. Uh, so there's by no means any sort of economic determinism in the sheer size of China resulting in a sheer power outcome. And the precedent that you could probably most recently point to in terms of these alliance blocks would be World War II, where the, uh, at the point where the US committed to join the Allied side of World War II, the ratio of the Allied countries versus the Axis countries was exactly the same, two times uh, in favour of the Allied countries over the Axis countries, although by the end of the war it reached five times. Uh, so, you know, there is strength in numbers and there is, there is power in, in alliances. So something for pause to, for China perhaps to consider good to talk, Peter. Thanks so much. Pleasure, Bev.